Welcome, everyone. My name is Richard Paulin. I'm the executive director of the International Trade Association of Greater Chicago, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this uh, webinar on investing and doing business in Spain, a legal perspective. Um, it is our pleasure to be a co-host of this, and I'd like to turn this over to uh, to Dan Harris right now, who's uh, the head of Harris Brinken. Dan? Dan, you're mu muted. Thank you, Richard. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone, depending on where you are. Um, I suspect a lot of you are in Chicago. Um, so today's talk, as you all well know, is going to be on Spain. And um, our firm started in Spain back in 2016 with a very small office. And um, people asked us, why Spain? And our answer was because we saw it as a reasonably priced center for Europe. And since 2016, um, we have uh, formed a very close relationship with the Monoreo firm, which has really helped us uh, a lot in Spain. Um, the United States is Spain's biggest trade partner outside the European Union. Um, the US ranks first in investments in Spain with 16.5% of total investments in Spain from, for, from a foreign country. And it is also second in investments from Spain, meaning it's the number two country for outgoing investments from Spain with 15.5%. On the flip side, Spain has the world's 14th largest economy it's fifth in the EU. It has a GDP of approximately 1.2 trillion US dollars. Spain has about 50 million consumers and 75 million tourists go there a year. In other words, the United States is an important trade partner for Spain and vice versa. And one other thing I would like to mention because it came as a surprise to me when we first started doing business with Spain is how important Spain is for even American companies that are doing business in Latin America. There are all sorts of treaties between Spain and much of Latin America that make it worthwhile for American companies to form an entity in Spain for going into Latin America. I thought I should mention that because that always surprises people. And with that, I'm now going to turn over the microphone to Nadja Vietz. Um, hello, thanks. thanks for the nice introduction, Richard and Dan, and I'm gonna share my screen with you. Uh, let me open that up. Um, here you go. Um, you should be all seeing my PowerPoint. I'm Nadia Feeds, partner at uh, Monereo Maya and off council for Harris Bricken in Spain. So welcome all to all of you and thanks for joining us today. Thanks uh, first of all to the International Trade Association of Greater Chicago for sponsoring and organizing this wonderful event and thanks to our colleagues from Harris Bricken for helping organize. We picked this topic today in order to give you an update about the current situation in Spain and um, to inform you about the new regulations which have changed the business landscape, of course, for foreign investors, because we all know Spain has been hit hard by COVID-19. And this presentation aims to give you an overview, not only, but not only of the new regulations, but uh, also of old pitfalls and old regulations and uh, old issues we tend to see when working with our US clients. Uh, but let me start with a quick look at today's agenda. So I will first be talking about new and old legal issues for US companies uh, when they do business in Spain. Then I'll give over to Andres Monoreo, who speaks about managing distribution channels. And then uh, I will speak again about FDI in Spain and new restrictions in place here in Spain. And Consuelo will speak about um, uh, GDPR and protecting your IP. 
Um, so there's a lot of topics, but uh, and if we don't cover all of those, there will be a question and answer session at the end, and we will be happy to share the documents. The handouts are actually already uh, here uh, online for download. Um, so let me give you a very short introduction of our Spanish firm, Monoria May Abogados. We have a very catchy title here, but we've indeed been around for over 30 years in cross-border business and uh, business advising. And um, we are about 30 lawyers in three offices in Madrid, Barcelona and uh, Palma. Most of our lawyers are fluent in several languages and licensed in at least two countries. And I'm also licensed in Washington State because I lived and practiced uh, almost 10 years in Seattle. And that's where the connection with Harris Bricken comes from. And then uh, we signed an alliance with Harris Bricken and uh, worked closely together. We are a full service law firm covering three main areas, which is corporate, litigation, real estate, and in the corporate, there are sub areas, including M&A, tax, employment, commercial agency, intellectual property, technology, regulatory, compliance, you name it. Almost everything we, um, we, we are asked by our clients, our companies uh, that we assist. So I will start uh, with, um, just wanted to give you an idea, but before I start, um, hop into my presentation, I want to give you some more numbers uh, after the ones that Dan just talked about, because there are those post-COVID numbers. And um, speaking about investment in Spain, it must be said that the spread of COVID-19 has touched every facet of the Spanish society and the scale of the humanitarian crisis has been matched by widespread economic disruption. So Spanish companies that had been riding years of reasonable economic expansion had to throw out, sorry, had to throw out uh, existing strategies and adapt. And I, uh, so I, I found this interesting McKinsey report dated September of this year, and it's hard to predict recovery terms, but they actually talk about uh, Spain's rec economy recovering by the end of 2023. And, um, and there's another statistic that I just found this morning uh, of October 2020 that talks about a loss of more than 11% GDP in Spain with 25% loss in consumer spending, 24% in FDI uh, loss. But they also speak about a recovery of up to 9.8% in 2021. So we remain optimistic. And interestingly, well, uh, logically, the, uh, uh, the impact of the crisis will be depending on the different sectors of, uh, of the industries. And McKinsey divided in three third, roughly third of the industries. There's the ones that have been hit the hardest that dropped more of, of more, more than 20% in revenue. Then they dropped uh, the ones, the industries that dropped between 10 and 20% and then the industries that dropped less, 10% um, or less. And um, of course, uh, the recovery time will depend on 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 the industries and on on how hard they have been hit. But uh, of course, we uh, we focus on those uh, uh, with the drop of ten percent or less because we believe they they will recover fastest, and they will also have to determine whether to pursue traditional business models or explore new ones and consider how their customers' needs and preferences have changed which in turn might or hopefully will lead to a wave of M&A and new partnerships and alliances and restructuring. And uh, But some changes are here to stay and they're good changes also. We've seen a significant impact of the contact-free economy and accelerated digitalization, which is good for Spain because we were light years behind uh, you, what you guys in the US know. And um, also there's more pressure on just-in-time and zero stock approaches. Um, with that, um, also, I will speak uh, more optimistic because we still believe that Spain uh, is, is the climate for investment in Spain is very good. And that's the uh, slide you're looking at right now, because there are several reasons for that. Um, first of all, despite the emergency regulations we have seen in the past several months, the legislators intentions are generally foreseeable in Spain. and. We also have very, very interesting tax incentives in place. There's the 
of what they call the foreign securities holding companies. That is a uh, special tax regime applicable to holding companies in Spain. And then we have tax treaties, double tax treaties with uh, 94 countries and uh, also most of Latin countries, South American countries. Uh, to avoid double taxation. So that's what Dan was speaking in the introduction, was speaking about, um, that it might be interesting even for any U.S. investor interested in Latin countries to go through Spain or a Spanish holding company. Also, we have very compet competitive labor costs and labor laws are very attractive for entrepreneurs while counting with a highly skilled labor force here in Spain and good formation. Spain has implemented an excellent infrastructure and uh, transport over the last years. And we are also um, part of the EU framework, which provides or guarantees competitiveness and services and product markets liberalization. Also, 14% of the GDP fiscal packages uh, that were recently announced in the measures in the G20 economies is in place to minimize long-term impact of the pandemic. So that means the magnitude of the Spanish government's response has been in line with that of other advanced economies. And last but not least, we have finally a stable political situation here in Spain. After years of re-elections, we have now a government. So that must be seen with much optimism. But let me go just to the uh, main content of this first introduction that I promised. I want to speak or throw at you the main differences that you will see when you decide to do business in Spain. This is, um, you have the usual distribution channels, uh, but there is um, big differences when it comes to commercial agency laws. Uh, commercial agency law can be very strict and onerous in Spain compared to what you know from the US. You have to have good contracts in place, particularly for your distribution agreements. Um, and um, also one thing to say when it comes to contracts, um, everybody in the U.S. signs with DocuSign or other ways of digital signature, and we don't. We are we are seeing that more and more. It's becoming more and more accepted, even now, uh, even more so now in the COVID-19 situation. But we are light years away from U.S. standards, and they're not recognized in courtrooms. So we don't recommend those. Also, once you form a company, uh, you will see very different procedures from what you used in the U.S. Uh, you will have to deal with very strict anti-money laundering laws. Employment matters are very, very different from what you know from the U.S. IP rules is different. Uh, we have the first to register, not first to use rules. So you better protect your brand before you sign any distribution agreement here in Spain because you might, might lose it if you don't register it. And last but not least, regular, regulatory laws are very much um, are much more protective than you're used to. And I'm talking about GDPR, consumer protection, environmental, food and energy laws. So you need to take compliance into account when doing business here in Spain and not forget about it because uh, high administrative fines uh, are, are given if you do not, do not follow those. Um, so speaking about distribution channels, which is usually what our clients do first when they come uh, into Spain, you have direct sales, sales representatives, distributor agency and uh, permanent establishment, uh, all the same as in the US. But watch out, the distributor agreement uh, can be considered an agency agreement, uh, can be considered an agency and the agent is very protected in Spanish law. and. You need to have good contracts in place to avoid claims and uh, wrong classification. And Andres is going to talk about that much more later. Um, so I'm not going into detail. Once you have, uh, once you come to a point of opening an office, opening an office or renting space or hiring employees, you are considered a permanent establishment. So you might be better off from a tax perspective to form a company. Um, so we have the most popular. Common forms of companies is the limited liability company, the SAL or the joint stock company. And those are very comparable comparable to what you have in the US as the LLC versus corporation. So if you want flexibility in your daily business, then you 
pick the LLC, the, the limited liability company. If you want uh, public, want to go public at some point or need investor funding or easy transfer of shares, then you pick the um, joint stock company. You do need to keep in mind that you need a minimum capital here in Spain. It's 3,000 for the limited and 60,000 for the joint stock company. And that also means you need a bank account and you need to deal with anti-money anti -money laundering laws. So you will also find that here in Spain, we don't form companies online and overnight, but there's a lot of bureaucracy and formalism. You will need countless notaries and apostille stamp documents, extracts, powers of attorneys, agreements, et cetera, et cetera. So just uh, you need to be prepared for that, for the time and cost factor. A typical formation will, up to, will take up to four weeks and you need to double that for hiring employees. And you might even have to add more time if you need now a prior authorization for your investment in Spain, which is the last part of our presentation where I will be speaking about it. Um, I mentioned the anti-money laundering laws. They're very strict here in Spain, and I, I don't want to bore you with the laws. Uh, I just want uh, that I posted on my slide. I just want to point out that this is European law, and no matter where you want to go in Europe, uh, um, there's no way around it. In any European country, you will have to be prepared for full disclosure, which means you need to disclose the ultimate beneficial owner, which is the individual behind the company investing, uh, that owns more than 20%, 25% of the capital or voting rights. And you need to disclose the activity on the origin of the funds. And um, and you also need to know that it's not only for the for the investment itself, but any other related activity or transaction you plan in Spain, meaning uh, opening a bank account or going to the notary, signing documents with the notary, or even hiring an attorney. Uh, the attorney will need to ask for those uh, in those documents and that information. And there are high fines being placed if you don't follow these strict rules. Also, employment matters are very, very different from what you guys know. We don't have at will contracts. Um, we have um, presumably indefinite contracts, very few, very limited number of fixed term employment. And the worker statute and applicable collective bargaining agreement define your employment conditions. Um, Important for the investor that comes here and uh, acquires an, an, a business is going concern uh, is that uh, it might trigger joint liability for all employment law obligations. So that's something you need to be aware of and have to have to have it as a point in your due diligence. Also, termination is possible on objective grounds, but always with a severance package. Um, for expat employment, you need to know that there's a totalization agreement, meaning the compensating of social security payments in each country. And um, lastly, we have new regulations in place for the um, ERTES, what they call is the temporary redundancy for uh, COVID-19 situation. And we also have now workplace security and remote working laws, which you need to be aware of. And um, what else? The Again, I said that already, protect your IP before you come here, register your trademark, and Jello, um, Consuelo will explain that later, yeah. and also avoid uh, data breach uh, and uh, consider the GDPR. And there's some several state of alarm legislations in place right now, but they are temporary. We have extended deadlines, virtual corporate meetings, and virtual filings. So those might be of interest to you. And with that, I will give over for the second part of the presentation to Andres. Thank you. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everybody. Thank you, Richard and Dan, for, and to the audience. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, managing distribution channels in Spain. What does it mean? Well, uh, basically, how to sell products in Spain if you decide not to create a costly structure in Spain, not to uh, hire workers or invest in fixed structures, but to um, sell your products through third parties uh, structures. Only one tip 
um, to know the cost of uh, the social security uh, for workers. This is a 33% of the salary. So if you pay 100, you'll have to add uh, 100 as a salary, you have to add 33% uh, or 33 units of, of money uh, for the uh, social security cost and the severance. 33 days of salary per year if, if you dismiss um, um, our workers. So, well, um, if you decide to go through these um, third parties uh, uh, um, structure and sell your products uh, to agents and to distribution, this is what uh, we are going to talk now. The difference between the commercial agent or the agent and the distributor is very simple. The, the agent is a, an a, a intermediate. He uh, sells the products on behalf of the client and receives a remuneration as payment. On the other side, the distributor acquires the product and resell the product, acquire from, from, from you, from the company, and resell those products with uh, logically with a margin. So uh, there are two legal bases for, for these two different figures. Um, the Spanish agency contract law regulates everything about the, the, the agency, the agent, the agency contract. And uh, there are no specific uh, legal regulation for distributor. Uh, is um, um, well, regulated in 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 in, in uh, several uh, provision of civil codes, court rulings, etc. But as you will see, there are some uh, analogous application of uh, the uh, uh, agency contract law to distributors. Well, in principle, um, the, the the contracts uh, does not need do not need uh, 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 the, the, a specific form. Uh, uh, there is freedom, but we highly recommend, as Nadia said, drafting contracts. Uh, and 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 you have to bear in mind that uh, when uh, you want to negotiate uh, certain clauses like. Uh, post-contractual or non-compete provision, uh, um, you need to uh, um, uh, write down those uh, clauses. Um, also, it is possible to choice a different law, uh, the, 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 the US law, for example, uh, but uh, you also have to bear in mind that there are certain uh, uh, regulation of the Spanish law for agents that are mandatory. So always you have to bear in mind those mandatory uh, rules. Regarding distribution, there are no uh, mandatory rules. So you, you, have, you, you, are, you will be free for a, a choice, for example, the American uh, law, if it's possible, if you came to this agreement. Well, um, here is the question of the remuneration. As I told you, the, the agent receives a, a, a fixed amount or a commission. As we will see at the end of, our, uh, of, of my speech, it will be uh, an, uh, convenient always to fix a variable. Uh, you can establish a, 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 a fixed amount, but always it will be convenient and is the 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 the, the custom to 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 fix uh, a variable on the uh, units uh, sold or on the uh, sale amount um the transaction of the agent um are subject to commission even when the contract uh, finalized under certain, under certain circumstances. For example, um, if the customer who uh, uh, buy the, the product after finalization of the contract do it uh, during the first uh, three months after finalization of the contract, or in case of exclusive, uh, exclusive right, for example, if there is a, a, a territory uh, of exclusivity for the agent when 
there is a sale after finalization of the contract. Well, this is only to well remember that we are under COVID uh, circumstances and not only uh, distribution and agency contract, but all contracts uh, right now in Spain must include uh, COVID clauses, basically force major clauses. That means when um, the events uh, produced by the uh, pandemic uh, constitute a substantial alteration or not, and uh, may uh, 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 lead to finalization of the contract. Um, and Rebusic Stantibus, this is uh, a very specific um, uh, doctrine. Rebusic Stantibus um, could be something in Latin like uh, things that stand in. This is a, a very unique mechanism by which if there is no regulation, and for this uh, point it's very important uh, to try to regulate, but if there is no regulation, in case of uh, a pandemic, for example, if there is an extraordinary alteration of, of, of the circumstances, the judge could modify the obligations initially assumed by the parties. That means, for example, that a price can be reduced, a term can be extended, etc. So it is better. Right now, we know that we are uh, involved in this uh, situation try to regulate uh, as much as it's possible to foresee what is going to happen, which is not easy, of course. Well, um, now we are going to talk about uh, another specific question which apply to uh, agency and distribution um, contract, and is a specific uh, indemnity um to the agent with the finalization of the contract when two requirements uh, um, um, succeed and these are that the um, um, the agent or the distributor uh, procure a new customer to the company and um, or the sales uh, uh, increase. Uh, there is a benefit uh, at the end uh, for the for the company when the contract finalized because there is a sort of goodwill uh, uh, which receive the, the the company and um, this is applicable to both agency and distributor uh, um, figures so what is the, the, the quantification of this indemnity? There is not a specific formula. There is a maximum amount, which is the remuneration, the, the, the average on the remuneration for, of the last five contract years um, for the agent is, 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 is very easy to calculate because uh, this maximum is the, 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 the commission. The commission, the average of the commission of the last five years or less if the contract um, had le uh, less than five years. For the distributor, the indemnity, the maximum of the indemnity um, is the margin and uh, it is not so obvious uh, what the margin is. But uh, in both cases, this is a question that generates as, uh, well, litigation and, and discussion. Um, there are also some other specific uh, compensations. For example, in case of the agent, there is a, 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 a possible compensation if the company um, order or instruct the agent to make uh, uh, investment. And those investments at the end of the contract has not uh, uh, been amortized. Well, this amount pending of amortization could be claimed uh, to the company. For the distribution, there is a, a typical uh, regulation, not an, a compensation, but the, there is the duty for the company to uh, purchase 
the product not sold not sold by the distributor um, due to early termination of the contract at the purchase price. Now we are going to talk about uh, well, I would say this is a pathology of uh, um, that in some circumstances uh, happen, which is the uh, labor classification of a uh, um, commercial contract. The, uh, the, 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 the agent, um, the agency contract is a, is a commercial contract. Uh, I said at the beginning, you are trying to avoid to hire workers create your own channel and you use a, an entrepreneur, uh, someone who has their own structure, uh, warehouses, knowledge, um, etc. And these entrepreneurs, at the end, if the situation is not well controlled, may come um, to uh, a worker or may, may be considered as a worker. And when these risks arise, when, when, when this a pathology arise when two uh, uh, requisites or two circumstances uh, um, are produced. The first one is the subordination. The agent um, uh, at the end is considered a, as a part of the disciplinary circle of the of the of the company, and when he's considered um, uh, worker as uh, workers on behalf of the uh, um, company. The tips, the typical or the typical facts that lead to this, uh, sub uh, to this subordination is, for example, the submission of the agent of uh, working time or the uh, control by the company of the quality of the work performed by the agent or the payment of the agent expenses. All those uh, uh, facts may create the evidence of a, a labor uh, contract. Mm. What are the consequences of this situation or, or of this uh, um, uh, pathology, which of course has to be uh, uh, um, Recognized by a court ruling, this uh, typically this 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 uh, classification came at the end of the contract, or when you terminate the contract with the agent, and the agent decide to claim uh, and to uh, ask for this uh, labor classification. Well, the the consequences are very bad. From well, the legal perspective, you 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 got a, a, a permanent employee. And uh, so, as I said at the beginning, you you'll have to pay social security costs, and if you terminate the contract, the labor contract, you'll have to to pay the severance. But you don't have only to pay the uh, social security costs uh, for the future, but also from the past. The, 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 you, you'll have to pay for the last years. Uh, um, uh, uh, contribution because if it's considered that from the beginning or from at a certain point the agent changed uh, his condition and, and uh, uh, um, uh, can be considered uh, as, a, as a labor from that moment you'll have to pay the contributions with a searches fine etc and from also from a tax perspective because uh, well in in Spain you have to um, uh, with the salary, you have to uh, um, take uh, tax withholdings. So um, all all those withholdings not uh, uh, apply in the past now can be claimed by the uh, tax administration. Thank you very much. Now. Um, I think that Nadia is going again to talk to you. Yes. <clears throat> so um, I'm switching to my uh, second part of the presentation and hold on, I need to um, change it. 
right full screen so uh as i said thanks andres um very interesting um so once you you decide to have your own uh, uh establishment in spain uh or maybe you decide to invest into another business then you might uh find that there are new restrictions in place and that's what i wanted to talk to you about very briefly before giving over to um consuelo uh so this is the landscape before uh, Pre-COVID, which is not really true because the, the those rules that I'm going to talk about don't, don't have to do that much with the COVID situation. But uh, basically before, uh, before this year, we only were required to file a post, ex post notification for statistics purposes, statistics, sorry, statistic purposes. Um, and so you, you would go to notary, sign the transaction, close the deal and then uh, file uh, a document and now turns out uh, there's a EU regulation in place since um, April 2019 and that came into force this October past October 11 and um, it changed the um, it, it brought some um, big changes main changes the three main changes I put them on the slides here is that it gives a framework for the EU screening mechanism and uh, note that the members have sole responsibility for their own screening FDI, and uh, but uh, it gives a framework. So it's a call for the members to uh, to pass those into national laws, and those mechanisms need to be transparent and not discriminative. Also, it gives an extensive list of factors that the EU countries need to take into consideration, which might lead to FDI screening. And Spain basically, in the meanwhile, has copied most of them. And But you can classify those factors into two types, which is first, the potential effects on certain sectors of industries, and second, the background of the foreign investor. And then third, there's a corporate, corporate, corporation mechanisms uh, introduced, which is basically um, there will be opinions by the EU Commission, there will be comments by other EU countries, and there's publication of all of those. Uh, and then there was right in the middle of the first wave of the pandemic in March, there was a communication from the European Commission released, which is, was a call to the member states to make full use of the existing or implement new FDI screening mechanisms. And uh, so what that means is all very theoretical for you, but that means that um, we have new laws in place here in Spain since March because they enacted what uh, the European uh, union called for uh, and you might need for your FDI prior authorization which means in a practical uh, sense that it might require another layer of your due diligence and uh, um, also more time that you need for, to get that uh, authorization and um, the law says it's going to be six months that the authorities have to respond but uh, we don't have practical experience in that regard and what it means also is that um, we had um, well, according to the recitals of those new laws that I put on the slide, the economic crisis triggered by the health crisis poses a threat to Spanish companies. Hence, uh, we need to protect those and have uh, previous control. And those uh, royal decrees 8 and 11 of 2020 suspended the former liberal procedure uh, of uh, our foreign investment regulations. There is an exemption in place for transactions of less than 1 million euros and uh, for up to 5 million, there's an accelerated procedure. And right in time today, uh, we had uh, uh, the latest royal decree cam come into force. It was released two days ago and came into force today. And it also includes uh, EU-based investors that for, on a temporary basis, some of their investments need uh, an authorization. So it's it's important to know uh, for you because that's in place until May of next year and uh, your investment might be uh, might need an authorization. And also what I found very interesting is that that uh, royal decree that came into force today opens the back door and gives the government authorization to modify the exempt amount of 1 million of, of 1 million euros and also uh, define the industries that are considered which um, which is important because that means there can be regulations every day and on a very fast pace to that investment restrictions 
And uh, what it means now is that we have to review if an FDI uh, falls under that law, uh, which means uh, it needs to be foreign investor. And also interesting, the foreign investor condition is um, uh, defined uh, according to his residency, but uh, not only the company that invests uh, into a Spanish company, let's say, if that company is outside in the EU, then it's clear. But if the company that invests in Spain investing into a Spanish company, but the ultimate beneficial owner is outside, then it's also considered a foreign investment. So um, there will be a lot to review in the future for, the, for certain transactions. And also the transaction need to result in controlling influence over a Spanish company. Um, there are some interpretative issues that, of course, we'll have to see how the authorities apply those rules. And most importantly, the investment needs to be directed at certain industries. And that's what um, I find uh, worrisome a little bit, because when you look at those that I listed on the, on the slide, there's critical infrastructure, of course, critical technologies and supply for central resources, but there also is sectors with access to sensitive information. And besides uh, having to say that those are all drafted in a widely and vague and open way, uh, we also have to say that Ever since the GDPR is in place, all every business owner knows that in the digitalized economy, there are probably only a few sector, uh, sectors which do not have to do with personal data. So that gives a lot of uh, room for the authorities to say we need uh, prior authorization for any investment. And what that means uh, for as consequences that um, if you don't get the, the authorization for your transaction, then from a civil law perspective, it's just invalid or might be declared um, re retroactively invalid. And from an administrative law perspective, you might be facing huge fines, which can up go up to the volume of the investment itself. So um, that's something you would need to take into account before starting your investment in Spain. Thanks for listening. With that, I give uh, over to Consuelo. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. Uh, so my name is Consuelo Alvarez. I'm a lawyer specializing in intellectual property and uh, personal data protection, and I'm based in the Barcelona office of Monereo Meyer, Abogados. I'm going to share my screen. So first of all, I'm going to talk about how to protect uh, the intellectual property in Spain. As Nadia already mentioned, in the European Union, it's, um, uh, we have the first to register, register basis and not first to use basis. So the protection will be achieved only when um, you re register the trademark or the design. Um, in Spain, there are several ways to protect a trademark or different titles of intellectual property. The Spanish Patent and Trademark Office is the public Spanish institution responsible for the registration and granting of the different types of industrial property for the territory of Spain. These titles include trademarks and trade names, industrial inventions such as patents and utility models, industrial designs and topographies of semiconductor projects. Of course, the protection in Spain of some of these titles can also be achieved by the registration within a supranational organization, such as the European Union Intellectual Property Office, or the uh, European Patent Office, or of course the World Intellectual Property Office. Trademarks and industrial designs uh, registered in the European Union Intellectual Property Office give protection in all member states of the European Union, and it has a lot of benefits and advantages. For example, by a single registration filed online and in one only language, um, the trademark or the design will be valid in all of the European Union member states. Also, uh, the costs are quite reasonable. It's um, much more um, reasonable, reasonable than registering the trademark in every national office. And, of course, um, it's a possibility to enforce the trademark or design in a wider, mar uh, in a wider market. And lastly, in the European uh, Patent Office, you can register the, in the industrial inventions such as patents. 
So I wanted to show some statistics of the uh, uh, registrations of patents, trademarks, industrial designs, utility models, and trade names for the last months and uh, in comparison with the last three, uh, two years. So we could uh, think that due to the pandemic, the registration have been low, has been lower. But the truth is that as these graphics show, uh, there they still are more or less the same. Uh, in fact, in some months, such as June and July and in August, the registration of um, trademarks, patents, and some of these titles has was even higher than on the last years. We consider that this is very promising. Uh, companies are deciding now to invest on the intellectual property. And, um, well, uh, this has been... Uh, can you see my screen? Okay, sorry. So we consider this very positive and very promising for the following, uh, for what is going to come. Uh, on the other hand, we want to talk about the GDPR and how to avoid data breach notifications and penalties. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to point out that the um, GDPR applies to European Union establishments and non-European Union establishment, establishments offering goods or services uh, or engaging in monitoring uh, personal data within the European Union. Uh, in order to avoid data breaches, uh, it's very important uh, for data controller and data processors to understand which are their, uh, what are their responsibilities. And also to make a risk assessment and an impact assessment before making any processing of the data. With the result of these assessments, it will be possible to start the processing, taking account all of the risks. And this is what we call the privacy by design and by default. Also, another way to avoid data breaches is, to, uh, is for companies to implement and update data protection policies and procedures from the beginning, establishing security measures that the employees and all of the um, parties from a uh, company from the uh, from the data controller have to apply security measures that can include organizational measures and technical measures. And on the other hand, it's very important to train employees on personal data protection, uh, concert surveillance of the processing from the data controllers and the data processors, and of course. Uh, once engaging in um, a processing with data processors to do it under a data processing agreement and only with data processors that um, offer enough warranties. Of course, it's also important to have a data pro processing record uh, in order to have a control of all of the data processing that is uh, being, um, that is, has taken place on a company. If there is a personal data breach, uh, there will be, this will be considered a seri serious infringement under Article 73 of the General Data Protection Regulation, which can uh, imply an administrative fine of up to 10 million euros, or in the case of a corporation, up to 2% of the total worldwide annual turnover of the preceding financial year, whichever is higher. Uh, data subjects may also lodge complaints with a supervisory authority exercise the right to an effective judicial remedy against a supervisory authority or against a controller or processor. Also, they can also exercise their right to compensation and liability. If the data breach happens, there has to be a notification to the Spanish Data Protection Agency within 72 hours from time of awareness. Only this will only be required if rights and freedoms of data subjects are compromised. And the notification has to include a description of the breach, a detailed description of possible consequences, and description of the, of the measures that the data controller or the data processor has made in order to um, avoid any, har any more harm to the um, personal data. Of course, there has to be also a record of breaches that, uh, that it may be um, asked for from the Spanish Data Protection Agency. And in, for the case of high-risk breaches, the, there must, uh, the data subject must be notified. I also wanted to include some questions that we have received during the pandemic. These are some of the most frequent asked questions 
uh, which include may employers process that information on whether employees are infected with the virus? May they transfer such information to the rest of the staff? Can employees and visitors to the company be asked about countries they have previously visited or if they have symptoms related to the virus? Is it permissible to process employees' health data related to the virus? In case of preventive quarantine or symptoms, is the employee obliged to inform his or her employer of the circumstance? And is it possible to monitor the temperature of employees in order to detect the virus? The answer to all of these questions is yes. The legal basis for the processing of this personal data is the public interest. And, but however, the data controller has to manage this data, has to process this, this data um, taking into account the principles, principles of proportionality, minimization, and limitation to purpose. So that's all with my presentation. And uh, if you have any questions for, for Nadia, for Andres, or for me, uh, we'll be happy to, to answer them. Hello, everyone. Um, so if you have any questions, please uh, type them in or feel free to ask them. Um, we have some questions ready to go from people who asked um, them before the event and a few that have come in during the event. Um, so the first question is, um, what are some interesting or exciting markets in Spain beyond Madrid and Barcelona? And that's well, for <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I would say that due to the pandemic, the not many, but some sectors uh, which have been um, benefit from, from this situation. And, and, and one, of course, is the um, e-commerce. You have to have in mind that uh, in Spain, the, the lockdown in March and May um, implied the suspension of the commercial activity at all. I mean, only um, the essential activities like uh, food or um, some critical products um, were um, uh, possible to acquire in, in, in shops. The rest of it, uh, the, the rest of the shops were closed. So um, the, the online uh, uh, commerce increased incredible dur during this period. And it was, uh, well, the, the trend in the last uh, year and, and, and Everybody thinks that now is uh, something which is not going to 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 descend. I mean, this is a, a clear trend, and um, uh, very very linked to this, I would say that logistics logistics um, uh, well are now the, the 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 best sector in the real estate uh, market. Um, because well, all, all the distribution of, of, of these of these products needs uh, uh, warehouses, uh, quick response, etc. So, okay. What about cities? What cities are you seeing? And I'm going to answer that by saying that we've seen a lot among American companies interested in um, Valencia. Uh, what what cities are you seeing among foreign companies coming into Spain other than Barcelona and Madrid. And I assume you're seeing a lot in Palma de Mallorca because you have an office there that does so much real estate. Yeah, well, I would say that um, the, 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 the best industrial area uh, for, let's say, uh, uh, to 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 uh, well to get uh, the the industry or the 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 the, 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 the um, well the the workers is is the best country the best country, um, I would say would be one interesting uh, region for uh, American companies which want to develop or find partners etc in this uh, in this sector. Uh, Balearic Islands and Canary Islands, of course, for hospitality. 
And Valencia, of course, uh, I, I think right now is one of the two or three most important uh, ports, uh, maritime ports in 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 in, in, in uh, the Mediterranean Sea. So, yeah, apart from Madrid and Barcelona, we don't talk about mm. this. Okay. <laughs> Because it's, All right. it's well, obvious. your answer regarding the Basque country is a great segue to the <laughs> next question, which is um, one issue that always comes up for our business, we are in the consumer goods sector, is labeling. Given the existence of regional languages in Spain, um, like um, Basque, uh, is this something that importers should look out for? Are there any other language related issues. Um, how does that work in terms of labeling? I know in Canada, everything has to be in French and in English, everything, no matter where you're selling, pretty much everything anyway. What about in, in Spain? Yeah, and interestingly enough, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to answer that question because I've looked into it before and I'm I'm actually the person to answer it. It's really only the Catalan government that requires uh the regional language to be on the label. So there's, it's of course a very complex question that requires a complex answer, but answering that question, what other languages need to be on the label? It's Catalan. If you're here, if you want to distribute in Catalonia, then you need to have it in Spanish and ca in Catalan, most of all. And of course, uh, there's also other Spanish labeling requirements uh, that are similar to those used in the whole European Union. So they must uh, include the name and the EU address of the distributor. Uh, you need to have a metric, metric units and uh, there's several laws that will apply to this answering this question uh, starting from the U European level uh, to Spanish level and then regional the Catalan or, or Basque uh, level. Uh, we have to say the standard US label does not comply with the EU's labeling requirements so that's uh, a lot to answer but speaking about languages it's only in Catalonia. Okay. All right. Um, can you comment on a law that Spain's government passed in September 2013 to help domestic businesses and to attract foreign talent and investment? Ley de Emprendedores. Do you know that? Are you familiar with that law? Yeah. Yeah. There, there are, for example, there is a very important benefit uh, on this law which is that uh, under certain kind of investment, for example, a real estate investment, or if you incorporate a, a company with a certain um, a size, you can get the what is called the golden visa resident permit. It allows uh, a non a, a EU citizen to get the resident, not only in Spain, but in all the Schengen area, which is, apart from uh, European Union, some Scandinavian countries. So, uh, yeah, it, it is interesting. It, it is a law with certain benefits uh, that, that could be uh, applied for for if I may add, uh, the interesting part is that uh, I believe, if I don't, uh, if I'm not wrong, it gives you the visa without uh, having to be resident in Spain. Exactly, so exactly. It's just Only for the investment. investment. Yeah, you, you don't need to stay uh, mm -hmm. in Spain um, at a cert certain uh, days or period. It, it is not like the TAS residence, which oblige you to stay uh, 163, I think, days. Um, but no, with this permit, you can uh, get this residence, even if you then live in your country and only, um, well, go to Spain for, for, for holidays or for work or for whatever and move into the Schengen space, which is well quite, quite, quite important. Okay, we have time for one last question and a very brief answer. And I think this is gonna be geared toward Andres. Can you highlight some of the important mandatory laws in Spain for agency contracts? Yeah, well, uh, as I told you, for example, the indemnity, the indemnity uh, clause, you can avoid this. You can't also avoid the investment uh, indemnity. 
the, 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 the clauses related to territory or the non-compete clauses must be uh, writing. So for all these, it, it is very, very interesting to, to, to write down all this in a, in a contract in order to avoid uh, confusions. Okay. And of course, then in order to avoid the, 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 the risk of labor, uh, 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 laborization of, of, of the agent contract, uh, try not integrate the agent into your uh, structure because it, this is at the end the, the problem. The problem is that you start to, to, to work with an independent party, but at the end, if you are very close to the party, it could be considered your worker. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you to all the speakers. Thank you to Richard for having us. And most of all, thank you to everyone who attended. Uh, if anyone has any additional questions, feel free to email any of us. And again, um, there are three handouts um, that you can simply download by clicking on, I, it should be the last button on the left-hand side of the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, and with that, we're going to be signing off. Again, thank you, everybody. Thank you all very much.